Thank you. Thank you for coming. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to be giving a short talk and then doing some guided meditation with you. So obviously my topic is meditation, but I want to give you some uh, key insights into how to make meditation really work for you, especially during times of stress and times of difficulty. I want to start by making a confession to you, which is that when I first started meditating, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I, I became a monk um, when I was very young, and it was a, a time of enormous stress and illness, both physically, but also I was having panic attacks and episodes of very severe depression. And I went to a monastery to try and get myself back together and try and get to grips with my mind. And when I started to meditate, I found it really difficult. I didn't like it at all. And obviously you're a monk, so it's kind of your job you're <laughs> supposed to meditate. So I was doing loads of it. And the more I did, the more unhappy I seemed to become. So I got into this state where I thought, well, I'm meditating and it's making me depressed. So I got quite frightened of the whole thing. I, I, didn't, I, I was obviously doing it in a way that wasn't healthy. And so, of course, I was lucky to have very good guidance from Tibetan lamas. I'm part of a Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Scotland. And through discussing with these teachers, it became very obvious to me that my main problem was I was meditating with a huge amount of expectation that I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel good. I was meditating to try and sort of feel something. I would sit down to meditate and think, okay, I've done a few minutes. Well, when is it going to, you know, when is it going to come up? <laughs> when am I going to come up on my meditation, like somebody on drugs? When am I going to feel something? When, where's the hit? Where's the buzz? Because I was so conditioned in my own life to only know of happiness as a kind of kick or a hit or an instant sense of gratification. And so I'm meditating in the same way and trying to get the hit, trying to get the feeling. And the problem there is that, that I wasn't recognizing that our minds are conditioned like, like habits. They, they run according to whatever habit the mind is experiencing. And if you want something, you're just creating more of the wanting. So sitting there meditating and wanting to feel something pleasant just sets me up for disappointment because wanting leads to more wanting. In that sense, the search for happiness, which is very much the theme of my book, you know, A Guide to Happiness, the, the, the search for happiness is the very thing that trips us up. Because through searching, through wanting, through grasping, we're setting ourselves up for more wanting and grasping. Whatever happens to us is never good enough, we just want more. So there I am meditating with that feeling of wanting, and I'm feeling disappointed because I'm not getting. So what changed for me was to learn how to meditate with less judgment, less expectation. And this is incredibly challenging for us now. And this was you know, 30 years ago where we didn't really have you know, phones and social media. And I think the internet was sort of there, but in the very infancy stages. Now, of course, we're in this phase where it's all about a very instant sense of fast-paced communication, fast inputs from media, from socials, from news. And so we're very jumpy emotionally and psychologically and want the next thing very quickly. So that challenge is even stronger. So what changed for me was to learn to meditate without needing it to feel a certain way. And the whole notion of non-judgment, the whole notion of just to sit with what is. And this becomes tremendously important when we're suffering. So I started to deliberately meditate when I felt unwell. You know, there's the, there's the usual syndrome where we say, oh, I won't do my meditation today because I'm not, you know, I don't feel like, I don't feel very good. I'll wait till I'm in the mood. I don't feel great. I'll wait till I feel better. Well, well we're back in the cycle then. We're back in the, it has to feel a certain way cycle. Whereas on the other hand, when you learn to meditate, when you feel unwell, when you feel unhappy, when you feel depressed, when you feel sad, what you're doing is you're learning to move towards discomfort, 
in a very different way to how we normally deal with discomfort. Our, our normal attitude towards hard times, discomfort, challenges, is to, of course, push them away or try to solve them. And to a certain extent, we can. And to a certain extent, it's good to look for solutions. But life is stressful. Life is uncomfortable. There are many things we have no control over. And back to my initial statement around wanting to feel good, leading to more wanting to feel good and just a constant sense of hunger. On the other side of the coin, we have another thing going on, which is that the more we push away discomfort, the more discomfort there will be. Because the mind has a inbuilt habit of grasping after pleasure and pushing away discomfort. And the more we grasp, the more we grasp, the more we push away, the more we push away. So there'll always be something uncomfortable until we learn to look at the mind itself and dismantle those habits. So what drew me to Buddhism was not really the idea of a religion or um, a sort of um, a belief system. What drew me to Buddhism was to discover that it's a science of the mind. It's a scientific exploration of consciousness where you start to look at your thoughts, look at your emotions, and start to work with transformation, work with how to deal with your mind in a more creative way. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because very rarely do we think about our own minds. We're very busy thinking about the outside world. Maybe we think about our own minds if we're having a problem of some kind, and if we're having panic disorder, of course, then we think, wow, there's something really happening here with my mind and I, I don't like it. But the meditation approach is to always think about your own mind and to understand that the mind is the, the source of everything. The mind, we experience our reality through, through our mind. It's how we think and how we feel. And that's something we can work with. The very, not much we can do certain things around changing the world around us, but it's very much about changing ourselves, isn't it? Now, this brings me to another point. So I started by describing how it's very tempting to meditate with a sort of grabby, graspy attitude of I've got to feel something. The other thing that I discovered um, for myself in those early days was that I was very uh, meditating. I was doing this in a very suppressive way. I thought that meditation means you have to sit down, close your eyes and clear your mind. So, of course, it was a disaster because the more I try to clear my mind, the louder it shouts. And so that pressure of trying to push away the thoughts, push away the emotions, just creates more of them. Just like trying to, if you have a very um, hyperactive child and you, you force them to sit still in their chair, they're going, to, you know, they're going to push and shout against you. So it's the same with the mind. The more you try to contain it, the more busy it becomes. So I really had to start to work with changing my understanding around this, that it's not about stilling the mind, clearing the mind, making the thoughts disappear. It's about working with them differently. So it's about changing the dynamic. That we, do have an un, we, we do have a strange dynamic going on inside ourselves with our thoughts and emotions, which is that very often we experience thoughts and emotions we don't want to experience and it feels a little, a little bit like we're being led by them, controlled by them, and this is making us suffer. So wh what are we gonna do about that? Well, maybe the first impulse is, okay, get rid of them. Just still the mind, it doesn't work. The, the more you push them down, the, the bigger they become. So how about changing the dynamic? So that's what meditation is. Meditation is not a trance, it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a, a sort of clearing or emptying. It's a dynamic relationship with your thoughts and emotions where you start to become the authority rather than they becoming the authority. How does it work? There's many techniques, but most of them involve focusing on something such as one's breathing. That's a very simple, very common technique. Um, so you focus on your breathing and then within three seconds you think you failed. Most people I know who tell, talk to, I, I'm so lucky with the work I do because I get to talk to so many people about their experience of meditation and that gives me a lot of information. Most people say to me, oh, I tried, 
but I couldn't stop my thoughts, so I gave up. It was too difficult. Now that's back to the old paradigm of thinking meditation means to clear the mind. So that, that's not it, is it? So changing the relationship. So you focus on your breathing. We'll, we'll try this in a few moments. I want, want you to experience it with me. You focus on your breathing, and then within a few seconds, the mind starts thinking about stuff. It can be very random stuff, such as, did I feed the cat this morning? It can then go to, I hate my neighbor. It can go anywhere. It can be powerful emotions. It can be mundane thoughts. The whole point is then to recognize that you're thinking. Now, this is the key, this is the nub of it. This is the key point in meditation, is recognition that you are thinking. That is meditation. Now, that's a surprising thing to discover because most people, when they're new to meditation, they're sitting there and then they start thinking about food or emails they need to write or whatever, and then they feel, oh, I've, I've messed up. No, when you recognize your thinking, that means you are meditating. You are aware that you're thinking. Now there's, a, now there's a relationship, the thinker and the thought. I am thinking, I am feeling, I am experiencing. As soon as you have that relationship, you can start to make changes. That relationship is so important because the, the, the part of us that observes the mind, that part is the part we need to get more used to. Let me give you an example, and then I'm going to go back to describing the technique. An example is anger. When you're angry, generally we know we're angry, with a, with a sharp, harsh emotion such as anger. If you're angry, you know you're angry. Or anything, if you're sad, you know you're sad. If you're worried, you know you're worried. Not always, some people are so much drowning in it, they can't see it, but generally we can see it. So, just the very statement, I know I'm angry, it means there's a part of our mind that is observing the anger, and that part is not angry. Otherwise, how can it see the anger? Similarly with sadness, with distress, with suffering. If we know we're suffering, the knower is not suffering. So in, in, in Buddhist um, teaching, they often illustrate this by using the example of the sky and clouds. The clouds can be heavy, they can be thick, they can be oppressive, but they are always within a vast backdrop of the sky, which is unaffected. So similarly, the, the clouds represent the emotions, the thoughts, the distractions. The awareness of the sky is beyond that and is pure, pristine, free. So we have that as the backdrop and we need to get used to that through meditation. So let me go back to the technique. You're focusing on your breath, your mind wanders, start thinking, planning, whatever, and then there's a point where you know your mind has wandered. Now, getting from A to B, from sitting with the breath and then knowing your mind has wandered, there's a kind of period of sleep, unconsciousness, isn't there? Because you don't see your mind leave the breath and go for a walk down this road of thoughts. You sort of wake up inside your thoughts five minutes later. So you're conscious of the breath, you're unconscious, and then you're conscious of thinking. That's meditation. So this is a key point because it stops you feeling like a failure. If you're meant to get conscious of your thinking, then it's great to have the thinking. Your thoughts are not your enemy when you meditate. They enable the consciousness to come back. There are actually three phases in a meditation session. Three things. Being with the breath is one phase. Being conscious that you're thinking is another phase. And then gently returning to the breath is another phase. So either you're with the breath, either you're recognizing that you were thinking, I call that noticing, and then the third one is returning. So breathing, noticing, and returning. Those three things are repeated again and again during the session, and they all constitute meditation. So if you know that practicing those three phases is what makes you strong, because it gives you a, a, a better relationship with your thoughts. You are, you are becoming the, the boss of your own mind. If you know that, and you know that noticing and returning are important trainings, you've got to have somewhere to return from. So the thoughts that took you away enabled the returning. Therefore, the thoughts are not your enemy. This sounds incredibly technical, 
but it's actually very simple. And what I'm trying to describe is a shift in attitude where you don't need to feel that your wandering mind, your rumination, your busy mind is a problem. You see it as part of the solution. And through this, you start to develop compassion towards your own thoughts and feelings. This makes it possible for us to meet challenges with equanimity, with calmness, and with a sense of um, non-judgment. Because we're learning that the challenges really are our thoughts. Of course, something horrible happens in our life, but how we think about it is the challenge, isn't it? And if we can learn to accept our thoughts, whether they be pleasant thoughts or unpleasant thoughts, then that's the key. So just to be with the thought without judging it or labeling it as good or bad is really the key. Now, to, to start this journey, I would suggest not even trying to meditate, because people often jump in the deep end and then think they're drowning. I suggest starting it with baby steps. And what I always suggest is why not decide that you will have tiny moments of awareness throughout a busy day? Because then you're sort of tricking yourself. We have to trick ourselves sometimes, because if you say, I must meditate, it's another thing on the to-do list. I must meditate, I must go to the gym, I must stop eating unhealthy food. These musts become incredibly oppressive. But how about deciding that you will just drop into that mindful state 20, 30, 40 times a day without stopping doing what you're doing? That could be very pleasant. You could be busy. You could be washing your hands at the sink. You could be standing in a queue. You could be stuck in traffic. You could be sitting behind a desk. And you could practice a micro moment of mindfulness, a little moment. So what does that mean? It means you just feel the moment without judging the moment. You are feeling the hands moving under the soap and the, wa or the water. You're feeling the ground under your feet. This puts you into a calm, present, positive state. And what becomes very interesting is when you can learn how to do that sort of against the odds. Because it's easy to do a mindful moment lying on a deck chair in your garden in the sun, sure. But what about when you're feeling pain or distress? Can we sort of lean into that sharpness of the feeling in a mindful way without pushing it away, without rejecting it? Because then we're learning to, to, to transform our relationship with challenges. So a very good place to start is whenever you're standing in a queue. Waiting is a thing that we do all the time. Queuing up for something, waiting for something. Those, those waiting moments are moments when we normally automatically tense up and we go into frustration mode. How about just totally letting go? We're in the queue anyway, it makes no difference. We may as well just totally abandon all hope and the queue will move when it moves. Me standing there getting stressed does not send shock waves through the queue that makes it move faster. It's pointless. But how about just releasing and relaxing, feeling the ground under your feet, dropping your shoulders? It's a simple thing, but it has profound benefits because what you're doing is teaching yourself to relax into discomfort. So you, start, you can start working with waiting situations. Then you can build it into pain when you're experiencing pain. Of course, I'm not suggesting you should just you know, exist with pain. Of course, you should see your doctors, take medication, do whatever you need. But there are moments when we just are uncomfortable. We're in pain. There's nothing we can do about it. What if that became the meditation? What if pain became the meditation? Would it then be pain? Maybe not. It would just be sensation. Pain in the body, pain in the mind. So this is how I worked with depression. I used to suffer from very, very severe depression. And things changed for me when I learned how to move into the depression without pushing it away, because I discovered that my depression was very much about a sense of rejection. I hate this feeling. I want it to go away. I can't stand it. I can't stand myself. I'm ashamed. All of those layers and layers of disgust on top of the depression. So what changed for me was learning how to sit with the depression and just move into it. Now, how to do that is easier if you can physically locate your suffering. And, and that is possible, isn't it? 
You know, when you feel uncomfortable in your mind, it usually has a resonance in the body. So for me, it would often feel like a, a kind of twisting sensation in the heart or a heaviness or a sinking or fear often feels like a fluttering in the belly or a tightness in the jaw. You know how you can feel your emotions in your body. So the technique is to drop the storyline, you know, the, the information, oh, I'm unhappy because of this, this and this, drop that and just relax into the feeling. Because what you're doing then is you're, you're, you are abandoning the habit of resistance and the feeling becomes your friend. You don't turn into some kind of masochist where you just want to suffer all the time, but you learn to meet distress with love. You learn to meet distress with love. Should we try that? Okay, let's meditate. I'm going to guide you through a short session, starting with the breath and then moving into the uh, technique I just told you. So, just try to sit nice and straight. You don't have to be sitting cross-legged on the floor like they do in monasteries. You, you can sit on a chair. But see, I'm sitting up straight. I'm not lounging in the chair because I'll just fall asleep. So I'm sitting up straight. When you try this at home, you might want to put a small cushion behind the base of your spine to give yourself lower back support. But for now, just try to sit as evenly as you can with your body in a kind of symmetrical posture. When I say symmetrical, I mean kind of balanced. Hands, palms down on the knees or the tops of the legs. I tend to meditate with my eyes open because I was trained that way, but many people find that challenging, so they start off with their eyes closed. But actually, in the long run, to meditate with your eyes open means you're just in the moment without trying to block anything. So it is actually a more... Um, profound way of meditating, but just for now, whatever is comfortable for you. It's always good to start the session by setting the intention of kindness, planting the seed of kindness and compassion. So take a moment to make a decision that you are going to be more compassionate to yourself and more compassionate to others, and meditation is going to be your tool for achieving that. So try to connect with the idea that this is good for me and it's also going to enable me to be more kind to others. So plant the seed of that good intention. Now be aware of your body. Feel the connection between your body and the chair. Feel the chair under you. When I say feel the connection, I mean literally focus on the sensation of sitting, the contact between you and the chair. Feel your hands resting on your legs. Just notice the contact between your skin and your clothing. There's fabric cloth, material, whatever you're wearing on your legs, can be sensed through the palms and fingers. You can sense that. Your mind might fly off into description, oh, this is cotton or it's wool. Just pull back from the description and go into the sensation. Bring your focus up to your shoulders. Most people hold tension here, especially if you work at a desk. So just let that tension drop. As you focus on your shoulders, the stress in your shoulders kind of rushes down or runs down like water ru running off a cliff. Just let that stress flow down and leave your shoulders. Bring your focus round to the front of your body, your abdomen. That's where you generally feel the breathing. Just breathe naturally. You don't need to start breathing slowly or loudly or deeply. Just normal breathing. But feel how the breath makes the body move 
a little bit. You know, the chest or the belly is rising and falling like a wave. Feel that. Sense that. Experience that. Bring the focus up to your face. It's quite good to move the focus around like this because it keeps the mind more harnessed in the practice. So move the focus up to the face. Feel the air in your nose or your mouth, however you normally breathe. Let the air be very gentle. Don't try to breathe, just let it happen without you trying. And feel the air traveling up and down your nostrils or in and out of your mouth. When your mind leaves and goes into distraction, gently bring it back. Keep bringing, inviting your attention back to the nose or the mouth where you can feel the breathing. Notice how busy the mind can be, or sleepy. Doesn't matter, just re refocus. It's like you fall off the horse and you get back on again, again and again and again. Let's try another couple of minutes. Okay, now we're going to do step two, which is to move towards discomfort. So just try and find in your body where you feel a little twinge of discomfort or a feeling of unease. Maybe it's the heat in the room, maybe it's a soreness in your back or whatever it is, or, or it's an emotion that's kind of making you feel a little bit queasy inside. Just try to find the sensation which is strongest, the sensation that doesn't feel so pleasant. And try to relax into that sensation without pushing it away. Try to move towards it with your mind and become almost into it or in it or absorbed together with it, merging yourself with that sensation. So you're trying to have a accepting and compassionate relationship with discomfort. Being with it without pushing it away. Welcoming it, allowing it, accepting it. Let's work with that for another minute or two. Maybe it's a sleepiness, maybe it's a feeling of nodding off. Don't fight that, just be with it, allow it.
And now just go back to sensing the chair under your body and sensing the ground under your feet, sensing your hands resting on your legs. And the last step is to make a mental commitment to your own compassion, your own sense of growing the seed of compassion within your heart. A commitment to really learn how to be kinder to yourself and kinder to others. Really try to feel that commitment within you. And stop there. So that was just a brief meditation and be careful not to judge it too much. Did it work? Did it not work? How did I feel? It's just exercise. It's just, it's just practice. It's not called perfect, it's called practice. <laughs> and so the idea is to try and do this every day. And I, just to recap, I mentioned how you could start with tiny moments of mindfulness throughout the day when you're standing, waiting for things, when you feel uncomfortable, or just washing the hands, brushing the teeth, chopping vegetables, and then it's really good to weave into your day a five or 10 minute meditation session. And the, the reason this relates to our theme today so strongly is because through meditation, we're learning to accept how we feel. Because how we feel is, is happiness or unhappiness. It's not outside, it's inside. So I hope that makes sense, and I hope it gives you some inspiration that might help you want to meditate further. But now let's take time for questions. There are some microphones going around. If you put your hands up, somebody can... Yes, there's a question there. Yeah, it's quite a small room, so if you, can, if you have a loud enough voice, just go... Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, this... It's on, it will be on, yeah. Yes, this question just came as a result of the meditation. Okay. And the fact that we're dealing with AI and, and lots of electronics. What do you think of the muse and this sort of... The, 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 the head sensors are meditating with... Head sensors? Yes. I've never tried that. <laughs> You mean you can put a helmet on and it helps you to meditate? It's like a band that, that helps you to meditate. It monitors the the uh, the brain waves okay. or something, and then you you're wearing he he earphones, okay, and you're hearing sounds, and okay. then it monitors how you respond to the sounds and. So it's interesting. It's sort of inducing it. I don't know. If, yeah. Well, it's interesting, but my my um, hesitation with that would be the uh, that you'd be dependent on the equipment. And so meditation then becomes very much equipment based. And how do you then take that with you when you're in a crisis, when you're at work and you're stressed, you can't put the headset on. And, you know, so, so I, I often recommend that people learn to meditate just wherever they are yeah. without needing extra, extra equipment. Anything else? If you put your hands up, then microphone can be passed to you. Oh, there, yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for that. What, how would you describe, um, you know, uh, the impact of med meditation as you got more practice, as you practiced it? The impact? Yeah, so what, what, what does good feel like? I, and I, I accept everything you said about facing into the feelings that you're experiencing and, and, and kind of um, un uh, accepting that about yourself and being compassionate. But when you used to fight it, you obviously had, had issues. When it, when it started to work for you, what did that feel like? It's very hard to, to, to know how meditation is changing one because it's a bit like growing as a person. Maybe the people around you notice it more, I don't know. Um, for me, markers of it being useful in one's life are that one, one starts to discover how, how to make yourself happy within. You, you're starting to discover that happiness is, a, is like a, a switch inside yourself that you can flick and relax into, so, so you start to discover that you, you can be more in charge of your own happiness rather than constantly giving it away to others. And then conversely, you can be 
you can bounce back from stress more easily. I, I get stressed, I get upset, I have the full range of human emotions, but um, I am discovering over the years through meditation how to deal with that differently. So I don't think success, if that's such a word, is measured within the session. Like, oh, it means I can you know, do it better. It's not like that. I think it's just about how your life evolves in a more positive way. Thank you for the session. Um, you mentioned about working with organisations, and I think in, I'm seeing more and more in our Western societies, meditation is becoming accepted. But how can we work better inside organisations to make this the normal way of being, rather than a few people doing it? Well, it definitely has to become the culture of the organisation, and it starts with a few people, and then it spreads. And some of the organisations I work with have now really started, they start their team meetings with meditation, they have meditation in the lunch break, they have rooms for meditation, that's a real luxury, of course there are many organisations where that's just not possible, but it spreads like a, like a I nearly said virus, but that's a very uh, touchy subject, um, it spreads in a positive way from the few spreading, and I think um, what really helps is if it has more of a scientific edge to it, because these days science is the gold standard for whether something works or not. And the more the research is put out there that this does affect your cortisol levels, this does affect adrenaline, this, this helps and there are scans and results that show it, the more people will adopt it. Thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, how do I fall asleep faster? That's my biggest problem. Faster? Yeah. Like sometimes I stay one hour just thinking. Yeah, that's the, the mind becomes like a washing machine at night, stuck on a cycle, doesn't it? We're just rolling around and around. So a very good way to, to let meditation help you sleep is to meditate in bed. You don't have to be sitting up doing what we just did. You can do a practice called the body scan or the mindful body where you lie down and you scan your mind through the body. And then you, you, you start doing that every night so that you're connecting meditation with sleep and it's not going to be an instant change but over time you start to have less problems with sleep also if you wake up in the night you can meditate when you wake up and actually if you meditate a lot you need less sleep when i was in we do very long retreats at our monastery i did a retreat of four years and during that retreat we had very little sleep the, the day ends at 11 p.m and starts at 3 45 the next morning and so there's less sleep but you're not you don't need that much because the meditation is deeper than sleep. Who else? Hello. Hi, thank Hi. you for the experience. I also practice sometimes meditations. I would like to ask you, how can you continuously improve the vibration around you to be um, enlightened with everything? How to improve the vibration around you yes. is, I think, to change your decision that the vibration around you needs improving. <laughs> Really? <laughs> uh, so total acceptance and love rather than thinking I need the vibration around me to, mm -hmm. to be better. It, it is what it is and it can be beautiful if one leans into it. Okay, thanks. It's a bit of a harsh answer, sorry, but it, <laughs> it, it relates very strongly to what I was saying in the talk. Hello. Hi, thank you uh, for the talk. I have actually two kind of detailed questions. The first one is that you said that uh, it's good to, let's say, to focus on a, either a pain or a sensation in mm. the body. And my question is, what if during that, that sensation shifts or changes into somewhere else? Should you kind of focus on the original one to no, try move, to move? move with it, yeah. And become curious about the movement. Oh, it's moving. Is it, how does it feel? Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it moving? Track it down move around with it, with your mind. That's very good. And uh, the second question is that you mentioned that it is good to originally think that um, effectively to give purpose to the meditation and to decide that... that oh, the intention. Is, yeah, yes, the intention. Yes. Is there a difference whether the intention is taught or whether the intention is felt? Thank you. Thought or felt? What do you mean? Effectively, I can think and decide, mm. or I can try to release my thought and just 
effectively choose to feel that? I think I know what you mean, and that's very difficult because when you're doing meditation every day, and in, in retreats and monasteries we do it many, many times a day, and each session you're meant to begin by setting the intention of compassion, and then you start thinking, well, do I need to feel it, otherwise it's just fake. It's impossible because one ends up just trying all the time to feel a sense of purpose. And I think it's much more important just to think it and plant that seed because that becomes a habit. We become what we think. If we regularly think, I want to benefit others, that activates the motor cortex in the brain, which then becomes action. Thank you. Time for a couple more questions, I think. Yeah, we have four minutes. Okay, I have two questions. Um, Where are you? I'm here. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so the first one, do you have practical examples of uh, meditation curing diseases permanently? Curing diseases? Yeah. I don't know, but... And, and it's very... It would be very... Um, it would be very unethical to make a claim, oh, it can cure disease, because it's not really the case. It could be in some cases. But what I think it can do is cure or transform our relationship with disease. Okay. So that's real healing, isn't it? If you don't mind being ill. Okay. And the second one will be um, stage fright. Um, stage you, fright. Yeah, stage yeah. fright. How can you overcome that um, instantly? Well, that's, that's, that's really interesting to me because I used to have loads of that and now I don't have it. Um, I used to find public speaking terrifying to the extent that the first time I did it, I burst into tears and it was really embarrassing. And then I started to learn how to meditate before and during giving a public speech. And then the whole experience changed. For me, it's now, now like having a massage. It's great. It's very relaxing because I've learned to bring mindfulness into that situation that normally makes me tense and scared. So as before I go on stage, I will, I will just feel the ground under my feet. While I'm speaking, I'll, I'll, I'll take my mind into that little meditation moment regularly th throughout the talk, and it just keeps me grounded. And it's become kind of a habit now, so that public speaking is no longer frightening, it's relaxing. So you can change any, any fear, you can change it through, through learning to attach meditation to it. Time for one more question, I think. Yes, hello. Hi, thank you so much for the session. Uh, my question is actually for people who are just starting out with meditation. So like you held the session just now, would you recommend um, that we learn to sit with kind of our own meditation and our own thoughts, or is it better to experiment with meditation through a guided meditation? Guided meditation is okay, but we have to be careful not to get dependent on it. Otherwise, we always need that calming voice telling us, do this and do that. And then it becomes a case that we can't take it with us into other environments. So I would use guided meditations a little bit, but then also learn to do it without needing headphones or something telling you what to do. So it can be useful, but learn how to use it judiciously. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your questions and for your time. And I, my one hope is that maybe tomorrow you'll meditate. Maybe you'll get up and think, OK, I'm going to do it. Or maybe you won't meditate, but when you're on the bus and you're hot and uncomfortable or on the tube and you feel stressed, maybe you could just feel that moment with peace and start to discover that even the most difficult moments in your life could be the very thing that makes you grow just like fertilizer on a field is made from rotten vegetables. <laughs> it's a, bit of a crazy example, but anyway, thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for that beautiful session. Thank you very, very much.